So first, a word of thanks. This sabbatical time has been enriching and rewarding in so many ways, and I hope it was to you here as well, these past 15, um, however many Sundays it was. Three months? Is it good? <laughs> while I haven't seen every video yet that happened while I was gone, I know that you were in good hands. Thanks to really good leadership and just a great staff. So thank you, Steve Swope. When you say something to Pastor Sarah when you see her, and of course, John, for your leadership, and um, for Renee for helping to lead us forward in this time. And if you guest preached this summer, well, Frank and Terry and Ken and Mary, who was at first service today, thank you so much. So much joy. There was so much joy last week. And Yes, we are about to build that building. <laughs> Took a vote last week, it's gonna happen. I had raven hair and a 32-inch waist when we started talking about this, <laughs> this building. And if you are visiting today, you're welcome to join us at Mason Park for the picnic. I hear it's a right and a left, a right and a left, a right and a left. So, there are four main churches in Zurich that grew out of the Swiss Reformation, led by theologians like Zwingli and Calvin. And some of you were with us on our Israel trip a few years ago, some right here, and were able to add a little time in this beautiful city uh, with its Middle Ages town core still completely intact. And so Carl and I stole a night to be there and to just see as much as we could and then uh, get around, see the Frau Munster, incredible church, and then to end up at a fondue restaurant that Carl was too tired to join us for that one night that we all went out. Now, I was single and I put my face, face down in fondue pot for two and ate the whole thing. That was great. <laughs> While we walked from our small place behind the opera house along the lake and up into the city, where we came upon this statue of Swiss reformer Zwingli, and just beyond him was the Frau Munster. The Frau Munster is a tall church with a stunning tower built on these ninth century remains uh, of a, a cloister for nuns who came from aristocratic families. And it's also the church that commissioned Marc Chagall to make beautiful soaring stained glass windows. And they're unbelievable. We were making the trip to find this church and to see those breathtaking windows again. The art of Chagall illuminated and shining in against the Spartan stone walls is something to just sit down in front of and reflect upon. And as we approached the church, there was something else that was going on. The entire church square was filled and had been given over to this open air festival with um, actors in period costumes and booths that sold mead, mead and uh, herbs and teas and cured ailments and vegetables and fruits and homemade bread and pies and the like. It happens on one day every four years, and we just happen to be there on that day. So a group of actors in costumes assembled in this long line and I got the sense that I should take out the phone and try to get to video what was about to happen. It was, it was a bride and a groom. The guests included the waiter, and the servant, the officiant, the well-born, the soldiers, the child, and even falling at the end, the mayor in his velvet. The main player in it was death himself, or death itself, wearing a red robe and having stolen the bride's veil. And he leads this whole wedding party around the square until, shaking and quivering, they drop dead in their tracks. And slowly the musicians rise, blowing their horns, and there is evidence that one day we will all be equalized by our own mortality. And if we are equalized then, then shouldn't we today be somewhat more equal today, short as these circles around the sun are for us, more equal in how we treat others or lift others up or bring us all together in a story where there is justice. And so here's a clip I'm going to show you. 
I'm not the best photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I wasn't fast enough to grab the first few notes, and to paraphrase Monty Python, no one expects the Swiss Reformation. <laughs> but what you see is one of many versions of something called the Dance of Death, and the dance has been performed for centuries in Europe to different styles, but it finishes with the summary of the allegory's main point. In the end, who was the fool? Who was the wise person, or the beggar, or the emperor? Whether rich or poor, all are equal in death. And the song, the music that is sung, is the same you heard, ad mortem festinamus. And the closing words of the song, if you have not changed your life into good deeds, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of God as blessed. So Carl and I are now sitting at a table near the front of the church. We are surprised, very surprised, that the minister of the church is alternately sitting and standing near the front doors quaffing huge amounts of beer. <laughs> he and what looks like members of the Swiss Guard are enjoying making the most of it. Soon we'll discover that he's an actor and I'll bet he enjoyed booking this particular job because who doesn't need a Zwingli impersonator from time to time? And Beatrice, Beatrice is a part of the church guild at the Frau Munster, and uh, she is a, a bright, energetic woman in her early 70s, and she asked if she could sit down at our table with us. Her family has been here at the church, basically, or on the grounds for centuries, having been forced to convert during the Reformation or be put out of the country. She has great credibility, and Beatrice asks what we're doing here on this day. And I told her we wanted to see this Frau Munster, we wanted to see Chagall, we want to explore a little, and then we want to find this great restaurant that has this wonderful fondue that I remembered. Beatrice stops, she takes out a cigarette, she lights it, takes all of that in, watches the smoke. And then she tells us that before this church building was stood here, it was a convent and Helena was the patron, and Helena was the patron of women everywhere. The real life Helena brought changes to protect women from physical abuse. And yet, she adds, women didn't get the right to vote in Switzerland until 1971. And in one canton, it was 1991. She puffs her cigarette, she blows it out, and she said, that's just one thing. We're not such a progressive bunch as people think we are. She says it takes real people to make change. If people like us do not take responsibility anymore, terrible things will happen and terrible things will continue to arise. She says our country, our countries are being pushed apart and we are becoming isolated 
at a time when we should be closer as neighbors. Instead, people are afraid and people are angry. We need to learn to forgive and just move on. We need to learn to do what we can do and then forgive. And she said, that's what I learned in my church. We are all responsible for what is happening in this world and we must think and change our attitude. We must, she said, we must stand up for truth and decency and respect. I'm very sure of that. This is where it starts, she says, not with the politicians. Civilian courage is the only way for the healing of the nations. What is happening is a sin, says Beatrice. But the greatest sin of all is this, that people should come to our beautiful city and sit outdoors in the hot sun, poking chunks of bread into sizzling melted cheese and go away thinking they've had a Swiss experience. <laughs> it's a terrible meal, she tells us. Fondue is something we only eat in the middle of the coldest winter and then only to keep us warm. <laughs> there are people in our lives who can say things like this and get away with it, and Beatrice is one of them. <laughs> and soon Carl and I are up and headed on, walking through the town, and find ourselves seated at the wonderful fondue restaurant. <laughs> Today's gospel lesson is about forgiveness. And there's a lot of comedy in it uh, as well because we're so unfamiliar with the currency and, and what it stood for that uh, we, we, don't, we just let this go by. So we would say, all right, so there was a rich ruler and, uh, and he forgave how many talents the, the slave had and then that slave wouldn't forgive the denarii. Well, if you would look at it in real currency, it might be something Jesus was wildly exaggerating about to make a point. It's as if he is saying that the Lord forgave his slave an amount upwards of $5 billion, while that same slave wouldn't forgive his friend who owed him five cents and a Hall's cough drop. How would the slave ever have borrowed $5 billion from the master? Forgiveness. And UCC theologian Catherine Matthews says, the immediacy and the depth of this very same servant when the tables are turned and he has the opportunity in himself to forgive would be laughable if it did not describe us as well. How good are our own measuring scales when considering how much we have been forgiven next to how much we have been injured by others? What do you think is at the core of our failure or our refusal to forgive. How many people step into our churches longing in their hearts for forgiveness and in the struggle in those same hearts to forgive those who have hurt others? So many, so many people come into our churches every Sunday. They're bearing really heavy burdens, things that are pulling them down. And there's anger and there's resentment and there, there's even guilt. And I, I don't know, maybe even some of those folks are here today. How many of us avoid finding ourselves in proximity to people with whom we fundamentally disagree and thereby passively avoid con confrontation by stepping so politely around the polarization? And maybe not even so politely, almost every week I read about someone who is proud to have blocked someone on social media that he or she has known all of his or her life. Perhaps we are the ones who need forgiveness for our absence of a dialogue that has been abandoned because it keeps running into the same walls over and over and over until it is such a frustration that we decide we're going to step back and only be with people who agree with us. Dear Beatrice, who can say anything or almost anything to me, says, 
Our countries are being pushed apart and we are becoming isolated at a time when we should be closer as neighbors. Instead, people are afraid today and people are hungry and they are angry. We need to learn to forgive and just move on, just move on. We are all responsible, all of us, each of us, for what is happening in this world. And we must think and we must change our attitude. The Dance of Death finishes with these words. If you have not changed your lives into good deeds, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of God as blessed. Forgiveness comes first, as my father used to say, for acid burns most the container it is held in. But if there is change, good change, life-altering change to be made in this world, you and your children and your grandchildren here today will be the ones to make it happen. It will have to rise, though, from the bottom up. And as Beatrice, the Frau Munster Church Guild member, says, we must all stand for the truth. I'm very, very sure of that. This is where it starts. We are taught civilian courage is the only way for the healing of our nations. Amen. Let's rise and sing our closing. Hallelujah.